listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a vet talking to a pet owner called Tony Davis. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Oh, she's fine overall. I just think it's time I did something about this. What seems to be the problem? Well, recently Bubbles has been acting a little bit strangely. When I take her to the park, for example, she'll pick fights with the other dogs just because they're, well, there. She barks so loudly, it's really embarrassing. Then, don't get me started about when she sees any males about. She acts really, really, well, randy. I've had Bubbles since she was a puppy, so I know when something's up. Remind me how old she is now? She's two. All right, and what are you suspecting? I don't know. I was reading around on the internet about what happens to a dog when she's in heat, and she's displaying all the usual signs. Is Bubbles your only pet? She is. We were considering another, maybe a German Shepherd or a Dachshund, but... I don't know if she'll be able to cope with that. I understand your concerns. Will she always be like this? Is there something we can do? It's getting to be a right pain. The neighbors have a pit bull, and the other day I caught him, leering at her. He got pretty violent. We've got a huge hole in the fence that I'm pretty sure was down to him trying to bash his way through. Have you ever considered spaying bubbles? What's that? It's abdominal surgery to prevent her from becoming pregnant. The medical term for it is ovariohysterectomy, when both the ovaries and uterus are removed. She'll have a faint scar on her tummy, but other than that, you won't be able to see anything. She'll be much calmer afterwards, and you won't have to worry about annoying or messy heat cycles. Oh, goodness, no. I wouldn't want to hurt her. Is there any other way? Don't worry. It's a relatively painless procedure, and it's all done under anesthetic, and it's over within two hours. She'd come in, we'd give you the painkillers for her afterwards, too. Plus, an Elizabethan collar to stop her from interfering with the stitches. There are other health benefits, too. Really? Like what? Well, for one thing, it'll reduce her risk of contracting breast cancer or womb infection, which is something that can be fatal. Plus, pregnancy in dogs can be quite a big risk that can produce medical complications. The list is endless, really. I can only imagine that she creates quite a bit of mess around the house when she's in heat. You've got that right. All of those months we spent getting her house trained, and now this. Okay, I think it's something that I'd like to do. Like you say, there are lots of health benefits, and I'd like Bubbles to live a long time. Plus, I'm sure you've done this plenty of times before. Oh, absolutely. It's a common procedure. It sounds like there are a lot of positives, but what about the drawbacks? Will she change at all? Her metabolism will likely slow down after she's spayed, so you'll need to feed her less and keep up or gradually increase her exercise routine. Okay. If you think it would help. How soon could we have this done? As soon as next week. I'll check to see if we have the space. 
Just make sure she hasn't had anything to eat beforehand. The food could react with the anesthesia and make her feel nauseous. Okay. And you say it'll all be done within a couple of hours? Yes. What about after the procedure? My partner and the kids have got into a routine with Bubbles now. We each take turns to feed her and walk her. Can we just carry on with our normal routines? Absolutely. The day after the surgery, she can eat normally. One thing I would say, though, you would need to limit her exercise for about a week after the surgery. I'd also keep her indoors for a little while. Okay. So we just ease her back into the routine? Right. Okay. I'll discuss it with my partner, make sure he's okay with it, and then I can call to book in if that's okay. That's absolutely fine. Take your time. It's a major decision. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. You hear a nurse talking to a patient, Jim Knowles. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Jim. How are you feeling today? I'm all right, Nina, pet. How are you? I'm having one of those days, I'm afraid. So let's have a look at your chart. OK, everything looks good. How are you feeling? Much better today. I think the morphine has started to kick in. <sighs> what are you like? You don't need morphine. Jim, you just need to eat a proper meal. What did you have today? Don't worry. I did eat my daily ration of slop today. I think they call it a hospital roast. That was for lunch. What about breakfast? Yes, I had the usual gruel. Very good. Your vitals are looking better already. Do you remember much about the fall yesterday? Yes, I do, Pat. I've been getting in and out of my Stairmaster without any problems for the last few weeks. I just had slip and tumble is all. Mavis called the ambulance, though, and here we are. OK. It looks as though you've sprained your right elbow. There's a little bit of a bruise forming. OK. I'll make sure you get an ice pack for it. Are you in pain anywhere else? I don't think so. And your hearing aid seems to be working just fine. How long have you been using a hearing aid? Around five months now. Right around the same time that I started wearing reading glasses, I think. Uh, no, actually, I got it before. OK. Are you near or far-sighted? I always thought a little of both. What's the one where you can't read things up close so well? Ah, OK. Yes, it's confirmed in your notes. Hyperopia, it says. If you say so. I do. Would you like your glasses now? I can't see them anywhere. Mavis took them to get the frame changed. They were broken in the fall. OK. Can I ask you, Nina, why all the interest in my feeding habits? Mainly because of your medical history, Jim. We want to make sure that you're not malnourished. From your file, I can see you had a bout of dependency on drugs. I did not. 
I was an alcoholic briefly, but I haven't touched a drop since 08. I swear. I believe you, Jim. It's just that your condition means that you're at greater risk of developing malnutrition. We want to keep an eye on you is all. We don't want to lose you. No, you are too kind. Will your wife be coming back today with your glasses? Not just my glasses. She's bringing Callum and Sophie too. Your grandchildren? Yes. You must miss them. Very much. I can't wait to take them fishing again or to the park. Those are my only hobbies now. I'm sure they'll be just as excited to see you. Well, if you don't need me for now, I'll go and see if I can find you that ice pack. Try and keep the pressure off your shoulder and arm in general, okay? Yes, ma'am. Will you come back later to see me before I go to sleep? Yes, if only to make sure you've had something to eat. You wouldn't want us to get the peg out, would you? No, no, that won't be necessary. Just ask them to liven up the menu a little, would you? I don't think I could stomach much more of that slop they call food. I'll see what I can do. In the meantime, let me fix your pillows. You want to make sure... That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at question 25. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about spastic cerebral palsy and its classifications. Hello, doctor. What is spastic cerebral palsy and how is it classified? Well, spastic cerebral palsy is the common type of cerebral palsy that also accompanies nearly a third of other types of cerebral palsy. The damage is in the corticospinal tract or the motor cortex. This part affects the areas that receive gamma aminobutyric acid that is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Spastic cerebral palsy is further divided into types according to the areas of the body that it affects. In spastic diplegia, the lower limbs are affected with little to no upper body spasticity. Most people with spastic diplegia are fully ambulatory and have a scissors gait. They may also have other problems like hip problems, dislocations, crossed eyes, or strabismus. In spastic hemiplegia, one side of the body is affected, which occurs when injury occurs to muscle nerves controlled by the left side of the brain, will cause a right body deficit, and when injury occurs to muscle nerves controlled by the right side of brain, will cause a left body deficit, vice versa. In spastic tetraplegia, all four limbs affected equally. These patients are least likely to be able to walk because their muscles are too tight, and they may also develop an uncontrollable shaking that affects the limbs on one side of the body that impairs normal movement. Question 26. You hear a discussion about different dose rates of brachiotherapy.
Hello, doctor. What are different dose rates of brachytherapy? Well, brachytherapy is a form of localized radiation therapy involving the direct placement of radioactive material close to or inside a tumor. Brachytherapy varies by dose, mode of delivery, and the location of the cancer. High dose rate brachytherapy is given over periods of 10 to 20 minutes. The radiation dose is delivered as a short burst using a remote after loading machine. Low dose rate brachytherapy is administered at a continuous rate in sessions that can last up to 50 hours. In the pulsed dose rate brachytherapy, the radiation is usually delivered once every hour rather than continuously. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about bariatric surgery. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of bariatric surgery? Well, there are four different types of surgeries offered to patients. The main principle of adjustable gastric banding is to decrease food intake with the use of a small bracelet-like band placed around the top of the stomach. The band restricts the size of the opening from the throat to the stomach, limiting the amount of food a patient can ingest. The size of the opening can be modified using a balloon inside the band that can be inflated or deflated with saline solution according to the needs of the patient. Biliopancreatic diversion with the duodenal switch, also known as the duodenal switch, is a three-stage procedure that involves the removal of a large part of the stomach, which makes the patient feel full after eating only a small meal, followed by rerouting of the small intestines to prevent food absorption. The third step involves changing how bile and other digestive juices affect the process of digesting and absorbing calories. Roux-en-Y gastric bypass method is also used to decrease food intake and involves creating a small pouch. The food bypasses the rest of the stomach and reaches the small intestine, where it is absorbed to a much lesser degree than if it had passed through the stomach, duodenum, and upper intestine. Vertical sleeve gastrectomy procedure involves removal of most of the stomach, which not only restricts food intake and absorption, but lowers the levels of the hormone ghrelin that is responsible for appetite. Question 28. You hear a discussion about oral lichen planus lesions. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of oral lichen planus lesions? Well, oral lichen planus lesions may belong to one of the following six types. Reticular is the common and usually asymptomatic that presents with a fine network of white lines called Wickham's striae, which are symmetrical and found on both sides of the mouth, usually over the buccal mucous membrane. Erosive consists of irregular painful ulcers covered by a yellowish pseudomembrane of fibrin, with the white striae all around the lesions. Atrophic is usually found as an ulcer covered by fibrinous exudate on an erythematous background. Bullous is the rarest type that is characterized by small or large vesicles, or bully, which break open, leaving a painful ulcer. Papular is an uncommon type, consisting of tiny raised white spots with the characteristic white striae at the periphery. The plaque lesions appear as smooth to slightly roughened whitish patches, rather like leukoplakia, found over the tongue and the inside of the cheeks. Question 29. You hear a lecture about the autoimmune diseases that affect the blood and blood vessels. What are the autoimmune diseases that affect the blood and blood vessels? 
Well, polyarteritis nodosa is a severe autoimmune disease affecting the small and medium-sized arteries that become inflamed and damaged. Idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura causes damage to the blood platelets that are essential to formation of blood clots. Antiphospholipid antibody syndrome leading to damage to blood vessels. Hemolytic anemia is caused when the immunological cells damage the blood cells. Question 30. You hear a discussion about different types of biosensing elements. Hello, doctor. What are biosensing elements? Well, an enzyme is a protein that has a high selectivity for a particular substrate, which it binds to, bringing about a catalytic change. Enzymes are commercially available in highly purified states and are therefore useful in the mass production of enzyme sensors. Enzymes can be fixed onto the surface of a transducer through absorption, covalent attachment, and entrapment in a gel or an electrochemically generated polymer. Antibodies, or immunosensors, are produced by B lymphocytes in response to antigenic stimuli such as foreign invaders or microbes. When used as biosensors in immunoassays, antibodies are immobilized on the surface of a transducer through covalent attachment by conjugation of amino, carboxyl, aldehyde, or sulfhydryl groups. Antibodies are sensitive to changes in potential hydrogen, ionic strength, chemical inhibitors, and temperature. Immune sensors usually employ optical, fluorescence, or acoustic transducers. Microorganisms, or microbes, may be used to detect the consumption of oxygen or carbon dioxide in an environment using electrochemical techniques. Microbiosensors have the advantage of being cheaper than enzymes or antibodies and are more stable. However, they may be less selective than enzymes or antibodies. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear the discussion between a senior doctor and junior doctors on differential blood test. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
Hello, doctor. What is a differential blood test? Well, a differential blood test enables the physician to determine how many white blood cells are in the body. There are five types of white blood cells, and the test also shows how many of each type of white blood cells are present. The results provide details about the condition of a patient's immune system and its response to diseases. Who requires a differential blood test, doctor? A differential blood test helps diagnose a range of acute or chronic conditions. And often this is ordered when trying to confirm a diagnosis, such as for any signs of acute illness, such as the flu or urinary tract infection. Or else they may be looking for a chronic condition, such as an autoimmune disorder, or one that affects the bone marrow. The bone marrow is responsible for producing white blood cells, so changes in white blood cell counts can indicate the functioning of bone marrow. A differential blood test may be ordered if a patient has symptoms, such as body aches, chills, fever, a headache, pain, or particularly in the bones. Although a differential blood test can indicate problems with the white blood cells, it will not be the only test that is used to make a complete diagnosis. The five types of white blood cells are Neutrophils are the most common type of white blood cells, which are responsible for destroying bacteria in injured or infected tissue. Monocytes also destroy bacteria, causing chronic infections and a role in repairing damaged tissues. Eosinophils are responsible for treating infections caused by parasites, and they also control the immune system response to allergic reactions. Basophils are the least common type of white blood cell, and their function is yet to be defined. However, they may play a role in allergic reactions. There are three types of lymphocytes. B lymphocytes generate antibodies to attack specific viruses, bacteria, and other foreign invaders. T lymphocytes help to identify cells that require an immune response. The third type, called a natural killer cells, destroy cancer cells and viruses. Therefore, each type of white blood cell plays an essential role in the immune system. When a differential blood test result is received, it should also contain a reference range of normal values from the laboratory to evaluate if the white blood cell levels are low, normal, or high. Overall, an increased level of white blood cell count than normal level may indicate the presence of an infection. Typically, normal values for neutrophils are between 2,500 and 6,000 cells. A person with a very low neutrophil count will have fewer than 1,000 cells, a condition called neutropenia. While the results of a differential blood test will give details about all five types of white blood cells, a doctor will usually focus on just one or two types. Depending on the type of cell, high or low levels can indicate different issues, such as a high level of basophil count can indicate certain types of leukemia, including chronic myeloid leukemia. It can also be an indication of severe allergic reactions. Patients with inflammatory disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis or ulcerative colitis, may also have high basophil counts. Typically, a low basophil count does not indicate a medical condition. However, allergic reactions, stress, steroid use, and hyperthyroidism can result in a basophil count. A high eosinophil count is caused due to an allergic reaction such as asthma, eczema, or a reaction to a medication. Inflammatory disorders such as celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease can also cause high eosinophil count. Usually, eosinophils are present in such a low quantity that low readings do not tend to indicate any health condition. However, stress or steroid use can also cause a low eosinophil count. A high lymphocyte count can indicate an acute viral infection, such as chickenpox, herpes, or hepatitis. Or else, a lymphocyte count may be high due to a bacterial infection, such as tuberculosis or pertussis, or a condition such as lymphocytic leukemia or lymphoma. A low lymphocyte level can indicate an autoimmune disorder such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. The presence of tuberculosis, HIV, hepatitis, or the flu can also cause a lymphocyte count to be low. A high monocyte count is caused due to chronic infections such as tuberculosis or a fungal infection. The presence of a condition such as endocarditis, inflammatory bowel disease, monocytic leukemia, juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia, scleroderma, or rheumatoid arthritis can also cause a count to be high. Most physicians do not consider a single low monocyte count as significant. However, low monocyte results on several tests can indicate hairy cell leukemia or bone marrow damage. A high level of neutrophil count can be an indication of an acute bacterial infection, inflammation, tissue death, stress on the body, or chronic leukemia. 
The neutrophil count may also become high when the person is in the last trimester of pregnancy. A neutrophil count may be low after an adverse drug reaction or chemotherapy treatments, illnesses such as myelodysplastic syndrome, autoimmune disorders, bone marrow cancers, and aplastic anemia can also cause low neutrophil counts. A differential blood test is one of the different lab tests that is used to confirm a diagnosis of an infection or illness. Now look at extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear the discussion of a physician with junior doctors on different types of hernias. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello, doctor. Could you please explain to us about different types of hernias? Well, inguinal hernias are located in the lower abdomen just above the leg crease, adjacent or near the pubic region. At times, they can also occur on both sides of the pubic area, which is called bilateral inguinal hernias. Inguinal hernias, along with femoral hernias, make up the two types of groin hernias and can cause pain that extends into the upper thigh or scrotum. Inguinal hernias can be categorized as direct or indirect. An indirect inguinal hernia occurs due to natural weakness in the internal inguinal ring, while a direct inguinal hernia caused due to the weakness in the floor of the inguinal canal and is more likely to develop in men above 40. The floor of the inguinal canal is located just below the internal inguinal ring. When inguinal hernias are repaired using the tension repair technique, recurrence rates may be more than 15%. However, other techniques used for hernia repair, such as tension-free and laparoscopic tension-free, have much lower recurrence rates of just 1%. A sportsman's hernia is a condition of chronic exercise-related supra-inguinal groin pain. Generally, it involves a direct inguinal hernia. Femoral hernias, along with inguinal hernias, are groin hernias, which are very common in women, but can occur in men as well. A weakness in the lower groin makes the intestinal sac to drop into the femoral canal, a space near the femoral vein that carries blood from the leg. These hernias are highly prone to develop incarceration or strangulation as an early complication. 
Incisional hernias appears in the abdomen at the site of a previous surgery that can appear weeks, months, or even years after a surgery and can vary in size from small to very large and complex. Umbilical hernias appear near the belly button or navel due to a common weakness from the blood vessels of the umbilical cord. This may occur in infants at or just after birth and may resolve by three or four years of age. However, in adults, umbilical hernias will not resolve and may progressively worsen over time. Epigastric hernias are more common in men than women. They occur due to a weakness or opening in the muscles or tendons of the upper abdominal wall on a line between the breastbone and the navel or umbilicus. Spigalian hernias, a protrusion of intestine or an empty sac through a weakness between the muscle fibers of the abdominal wall, often on the right-hand side of the abdomen. It becomes impossible to detect because often there is no obvious swelling or lump. It develops between the muscles of the abdominal wall rather than protruding through layers of fat. It often develops in later life of men and women when the abdominal muscles become weaker. Hadal hernias are slightly different from other types of hernias because they are a weakness or opening in the diaphragm that separates the chest cavity from the abdominal cavity. These hernias cause reflux of acid from the stomach into the esophagus, resulting in heartburn, pain, and erosion of the esophagus. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.